12 things that suggest Bitcoin is a speculative bubble. Now, as you can see, this is one of the ideas or one of the, the, the posts on, on TradingView. And I think it's quite interesting. Some of the points I've been reading through them. And uh, it's always good to have a, a diverse view on, or on something, especially like Bitcoin. So I thought I'd spend some time using ChatGPT to ask these types of questions, because anyone that's going to invest into a possible speculative bubble should do a little bit of prior research beforehand. So in this video, we're going to be uh, asking ChatGPT and going through the points about 12 things that suggest Bitcoin is a speculative bubble. And then we're also going to be asking uh, it 12 things that suggest Bitcoin is not a speculative bubble. So we're going to be asking the, the opposite question. And then also 12 reasons why people should buy Bitcoin today, regardless of being a speculative bubble. Right. So and then the final one is five reasons why Bitcoin is not a store of value. And these are questions that maybe if you are pro or counter, counter pro or counter um, Bitcoin, these are, you know, questions prior to making an investment that you should kind of like look at, you know, because it's just looking at one side is never the good thing. So with that said, before we get started, my name is David Thorne. I am heavily invested into Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as well, but I do have other money stored in other stocks and I will be buying Tesla uh, over the course of this year and possibly other uh, stocks in other companies too. But right now we're just talking about Bitcoin because I like to have a diverse um, portfolio as such. So let's start with the first one here. So 12 things that suggest Bitcoin is a speculative bubble. So volatility. Bitcoin's price is notoriously volatile with extreme fluctuations occurring within a short time frames. While volatility is common in emerging markets, Bitcoin swings often defy traditional market logic, indicating speculative trading patterns. Now, when you look at um, a move in Bitcoin, you know, you can go up 1%, 5%, 10% in one day, and it can come back down 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 uh, on the next day or within the same day as well. So there can be like rapid moves up and rapid moves down. Now, gold can do these moves as well. OK, and so if we are saying that Bitcoin is a bubble and gold is not a bubble, right? Gold can do these moves as well. Is it, it just doesn't move in like 10%. It moves in like 1%. 1% is like a really big move. And recently over the past year, it's been moving in like 1% moves or 1.5% moves quite often now. So we see that something is, is a little bit off with the market overall. Okay. So is it just that Bitcoin's movements relative to gold are just a lot bigger? OK, and, and Bitcoin is only around about 10 years old or it's, it's, it's a bit more than 10 years old now anyway. So but gold obviously is a lot older. So now the media hype, media coverage of Bitcoin tends to be sensationalized, focusing on its meteoric rise is in rather value rising value rather than its underlying technology fundamentals. This hype can artificially inflate demand and drive um, in speculative investment. We like any stock. You have to look at the fundamental technology. People could say that Reddit doesn't have any fundamentals, even though it's had an IPO over the past days. Yes, it's a platform for people to talk back with each other about different topics, but like, like Facebook has lots of business, it has the open graph. So businesses can attach their information on it. There's advertising, there's communities, there's all sorts of stuff. Now, I'm not a fan of Reddit, but I don't use it. So I can't tell you whether it really is good or bad. I just never really used it. Um, but that's not to say it doesn't have fundamentals, but does it have fundamentals like some other companies in the world that do also have good value? But Bitcoin, with its with its uh, ledger, you know, this is where the fundamentals are. The technology behind it forces transparency. And this is it. And we could go into depth into this, but you can always look at transactions and they're publicly available. So if someone has says they've, tr they've moved asset A to asset B or they've moved asset A from person A to person B, 
you can see the history of it. Now, if you own that asset, you can see where it originated from um, and which address it originated from. So you do have the, the fundamentals are there and it is the ledger and it is the transparency that it has. Now, FOMO comes with everything. So we could have it on a new IPO like Reddit. We could have it on absolutely anything. So fear of missing out comes on all bubbles, right? And it comes on all stocks and shares. So this is, it's wrong to say FOMO is directly linked to Bitcoin. It's just a part of life. Lack of intrinsic value. Unlike traditional assets such as stocks or real estate, Bitcoin lacks intrinsic value. Its price is solely determined by supply and demand dynamics, making it success, successful to success. <laughs> I'm going to skip over it to bubbles, right? Yes, but you could say that about a watch. You know, you could go and buy a Rolex. Yes, it's handmade. Yes, it's lots of parts, but it's just a lot of metal and glass that's been put together, and then suddenly to put, say, a hundred or fifty. 50,000 or 100,000 euros, pounds or whatever value on it, because it's not. That is just what the, the price that someone is willing to pay for it. So it's intrinsic value is the value of the metal that it's made of. Now, we all know that metal can just be made up. So really, a Rolex has no intrinsic value because it's just metal. But it's the work that's put into it. It's the expertise that's put into it. That's what I mean. It's the work that's put into it is the intrinsic value. And for it to be fixed, you need an expert to take it apart to fix it. So the, the physical object itself doesn't have any intrinsic value. It's the work put into it. And Bitcoin also needs a lot of work, computer work, we'll get on to later, to generate the hashes, to generate the Bitcoins, and to create, to update the ledger. And you need a, a, a worldwide use of Bitcoin to, to, to verify the ledger. So its intrinsic value is its safety as such, you know, it's its transparency that everyone is always checking in it and it requires some form of work in order to do this, right? People need to be paid for it. So does it have an intrinsic value? Well, if you want to buy something, you need, you need a medium to be able to buy that other thing off the other person and each party needs to be happy with whatever currency or store of value that you are passing. Or it doesn't have to be a store of value, it just happens to be that each person on each side is happy with that transaction. And in this case, we are saying the medium is then a hash, right, or bitcoins. Speculative trading, well, this comes with everything anyway. So you could have a stock, you could have a a uh, a penny penny coins or whatever, or penny penny um, stocks. This comes with everything and anything anyway. All right. So pump and dump schemes. This is not related directly to cryptocurrency. Pump and dump schemes come with everything. Okay. Market irrationality. There's gambling, market irrationality in all stocks. So you can't just directly link this to cryptocurrency. If you want to get into the stock market, I have I have friends of my family, of my parents that used to trade in 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 stocks long before there was anything called cryptocurrency. And there is still irrationality there. There has been bubbles for history, you know, all the time. So we can't directly link irrationality to cryptocurrency. That's just a part of human life. Regulatory uncertainty. Well, Bitcoin has been, it, even though it can't be um, regulated, there are a lot of people like Coinbase and so on, making sure that they know who their customer is. So before you go onto one of the exchanges, you have to show your passport, you need a bank account, you need this, that and the other. So yes, you, you have to do this first of all. So you can always trace back where the euros, dollar, yen or whatever came from to go onto the, the, the actual Bitcoin network itself. So really, can you buy Bitcoin without going on any of these networks? Not really. So there is some form of uh, there is some form of regulation. And now we have all the ETFs and so on. So th this is this is it's in its infancy right now. But there has been countries that have adopted it. So it is happening. Um, tether controversy. The USDT has faced scrutiny over its alleged role in manipulating Bitcoin prices. We have seen this. 
right? We've seen this in, in all stocks everywhere, insider trading. You see it all day long with politicians in everything that they do, the Olympics or whatever. You see this type of, of manipulation everywhere. So human beings manipulate stuff. So if they can manipulate Bitcoin, if they can manipulate the euro, they can manipulate the dollar, they can manipulate grains of sand being sold to each other, or you can manipulate gas prices, you can manipulate oil prices, you can manipulate the prices of, of, um, of medication. There's manipulation everywhere. So this would just be reductionism to look directly at Bitcoin being manipulated because on a whole, everything's being manipulated here. And I'm not being biased. I am literally being neutral here. So lack of adoption as a currency. Well, we've got Venezuela and we've got other countries that you, where you can actually use it today. Just because every country hasn't adopted it right yet, right already, doesn't mean to say that it doesn't have any usage. Okay, so it, it's just a case of when, when they first got the euro, you know, I was there on the first evening when the euro started. No one had adopted it yet. But the day that everyone decided, right, we're going to agree at 12 o'clock at night time, we're all going to be using euro. That was when it was adopted. And there was only, you know, like 27 countries out of the 170, I think it's 168 countries in the world that were adopting it. So that's not more than 50 percent have adopted the euro. So uh, but despite being touted as digital currency, Bitcoin sees limited adoption as a medium of exchange for everyday transactions. Its primary use case remains speculative investment, further indicated. There, there is a little bit of truth in here because, you know, one day you can buy a house with it. Next day, you couldn't buy a box of matches with it. And then the next day, you can buy five houses with it. That is an absolutely... I, I am really, really exaggerating that. But there is an element of truth in that. Historical price patterns. Bitcoin has experienced multiple boom and bust cycles since its exception, with each cycle categorized by rapid price appreciation followed by sharp corrections. This historical pattern aligns with typical bubble dynamics. Well, yes, okay, um, but all other stocks previously, um, they used to have huge volatility as well. But before they started getting regulated, when there's lots of volume coming in, there's lots of people trading, that means that the price doesn't move a lot. Because if there's one person says, I'm only going to buy it for this price, and someone's selling it for a, a huge price, and there's only one person buying it, but that person needs that money, they need that currency, then they're going to have to capitulate and sell it at any price. But if there is 100 million people all wanting to buy it, right? Then you would be able to sell it at the exact price you wanted to, and there would be zero volatility in that, you see? So the more people that want something, the less volatile it gets. So adoption by the institutions and more people will bring the volatility down. So, and with regulation, it will bring it down as well. So it's it's kind of like you, you need to have volatility in the beginning to bring in those investors because they need to earn lots of money in the beginning for the future. Dependency on sentiment. Bitcoin's price often correlates with investor sentiment rather than underlying fundamentals. Positive news or social media buzz can drive prices higher, while negative sentiment can trigger steep sell offs I mean, just look at the, the, the US dollar against the euro or the pound. It can literally spike on the, 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 the release of the smallest amount of news. So does do the other things do this as well? Yes, they do. Do they get... The, uh, do the prices of, I mean, I watched the euro against the dollar just tank every single day because of media, because of all different things are going on in the world, right? And every single day, lose value, lose value, lose value constantly until it was, it was worth less than a dollar, right? And I've never seen this before. And this happened literally on a constant daily basis. And we could see this happen in 2008. We've seen this happen in 99. We've seen this happen in other times. Well, I haven't, but we've seen this happens in other times as well. So does this happen on everything? Well, kind of. So it's wrong to, to say that Bitcoin is the first to do this, right? It does do it, but it's not the first to do it. So 
While Bitcoin has shown resilience and staying power despite numerous price fluctuations, these factors collectively suggest caution. That's the correct thing. Caution for investors, highlighting the speculative risks associated with the crypto. Risks. You always are going to take a risk. If you don't want any risk, don't buy stocks. Keep your money in a certain thing. Now, but you always know with inflation that your money is always being debased anyway, because banks, federations, they are constantly printing money, right? Because they need it to pay for other things. So your money, is your money losing value just in your bank? So could you put it elsewhere where there is more risk that you could lose it, but the reward is extremely higher rather than by default, you lose money, right? So at one point you have to decide, do I want to just keep intrinsically losing my money because someone else is debasing that currency? So despite the skepticism surrounding Bitcoin's market dynamics, several factors suggest that it might not be a speculative bubble, right? So now we're looking at the counter arguments. Growing institutional adoption. So since the beginning of this year, we've got the ETF. So in, institutional investors, include hedge fund, asset managers and corporations are increasingly allocating funds to Bitcoin. Now, at the moment, they've only allocated a tiny amount, but they are. This institutional adoption signal grows confidence in Bitcoin as a legitimate asset class rather than speculative fad. So we're not saying it isn't speculative. We we all know it's speculative. And that's why you get into something in the beginning, because it is speculation about how it's going to be in the future. We are saying, like me, I've put money in, not all of my money in, I've put my money in relative because I'm taking a gamble that it's going to be that price in the future. Now, I could buy a house and I know people that have put money into a house prior to 2008 and you know they, they bought the house with another person and then come 2008 they literally got the other half of the house for free near enough because it, it just lost nearly all of its value so but the person bought the house with the intention that they were going to be able to sell it or get their money back in the future or if make more profit in the future and this is on the housing market so you have to take it with a grain of salt limited supply Bitcoin is capped at 21 millions. Done. That is it. And this is what gold is. You know, it is literally limited supply. There isn't any more of it. So once it's created, it's created. And there's no, you can't have inflation with Bitcoin because you can't create more. Uh, but the Federal Reserve, Bank of England, Bank of China, European Central Bank, we just keep on going. They can print money just because they can print it and print it and print it whenever they want. All right. And they, that this is going to happen. So they are debasing the currency consistently. That's why when I was at school, when I was a child, penny sweets cost a penny. And you could buy a bag of like 20 sweets for 20p, right? And today, if you go to the penny shop to buy 20 sweets, they will tell you it costs about four euros. And that is, I mean, I, I think I actually bought less than five or six sweets last time. And that cost me about four euros. So you know, that is inflation. That is how my money, the, the, the pennies that I had when I was a child, are, are worth nothing today. And that's why I don't even ask for the pennies back or the cents back anymore in Germany, because they're worthless. So creating scarcity akin to precious metals like gold. Gold, it, it, it's, it's, it's not any more of it, right? Once, once you've got it all out of the ground and it's stored in a safe, there's no more of it. It's a fixed supply combined with half an event. So Bitcoin is a fixed supply combined with half an event that reduced the rate of new coin insur issuance, providing deflationary mechanisms. So it actually does the opposite of what the other governments are doing with their money. And this is all linked to the increase in the hash rate as well. It is, it's harder. Every single four years, it gets even harder to create Bitcoins, all right? And this is the, this is the technical part of it. This is the fundamental parts of it. It's the, the longer we go with this, the harder it gets to make it, the more scarce it gets, the more work you've got to put into it, which will make people think, well, I need this. Widespread acceptance We've got, it's still going to take 10, 20, 30 years, if anything, until the world is using it. And remember, digital currency, it doesn't matter. We don't need any, any physical stuff anymore. 
And so you don't need to move pieces of metal or pieces of paper from A to B across the world. It's just all digital. That is all it is. Um, hedge against inflation. Like I've already said, if you've got $1,000 in your bank account here and you are like, I'm not going to do anything with my $1,000 with this. And on that one day, that $1,000 can buy however many loaves of bread, right? In 12 months time, you will still have your $1,000. They will still be making bread, but you won't be able to get the same amount of bread for it. You'll have less amount of bread for it unless the, that country has gone through huge deflation. Then you'll be able to get more bread. The likelihood of that is zero, okay? And uh, yeah, there's only one country in the world at, at the moment nearly go, or going into deflation is China. Um, but that's because it, it, it did other stuff. Inflation concerns stem from central bank monetary policies have led some investors to view Bitcoin as a hedge against currency depreciation and inflation pressures. This perceived store of value characteristic as fundamental support to Bitcoin's price. So the, the Bank of England, the Federal Reserves, the Euro European Central Bank, Bank Republic of China, whatever it's called, they do monetary policy, policies, okay? The likes of the, the, the governments, so the British government, German governments, they do fiscal policies, okay? So don't ever get them mixed up. Fiscal policy is the raising taxes, lowering taxes, and all this stuff. Monetary policy is the buying stuff, creating money in the beginning, okay? So global economic uncertainty, we have seen over the past couple of years how the world can affect the price of gas, oil, food, toilet paper, cars, and so on. So I don't think I need to tell you about this. This can happen with or without cryptocurrencies. Growing ecosystem. The Bitcoin ecosystem continues to expand with the development of infrastructure, financial products, and services built around the cryptocurrency. This growing ecosystem fosters innovation and adoption underpinning Bitcoin's long-term value proposition. So the more and more people get to know it, the more and more people start buying it, using it, and so on, naturally, the more and more people will start buying it, using it, and so on even further. So it is like this vicious circle. You know, the more people use it, more people buy stuff, the more people will want it. The halving events we spoke about already, this is to, to assist with um, that the, the, it becomes more scarce and it becomes more difficult to create it and that the, that the mining companies are going to profit less for mining it every single four years to make it harder. Um, network resilience. Despite occasional price volatility, Bitcoin's network has demonstrated resilience against anti yeah, without withstanding regulatory challenges. Look, I've got a computer sat here with the Bitcoin network on it. So if someone's got to go around the whole world and literally destroy every single computer to be able to, to take this network down. So that I think that's enough said already that it has the, the infrastructure, the backbone that no country will be able to interfere with this. They won't be able to because that's the whole implementation, the whole idea of it. Diversification benefits. Some investors view Bitcoin as a portfolio diversifier. Um, so you shouldn't put all your money into one basket. And that's with or without talking about Bitcoin. So if you you should have some money in cash, have some money in, in house, have some money in other um, uh, precious metals, put some money into Bitcoin, put some money into banks, and so on. So you should always have the diversification with or without Bitcoin anyway. That's just called portfolio di diversity. So, you know, it's not directly related to Bitcoin. Growing retail participation. Yeah, this is the 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 normal people. We are the retail. You know, the normal people that go and buy their 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 fuel with their credit cards, their money, and so on in the shops. The more and more people use it, the more you know. With with mobile phones here today, and literally just like um, you, I never use my cards anymore. Just with my mobile phone, we're done. So, and now today with with paying the bill, you scan a QR code and it's done. So. Cryptocurrency in general is going to be pretty good when it comes to this type of stuff because it's easy. It just needs to be a bit faster right now. So if anything, this is a pro against it. Longevity and network effects. So Bitcoin's decade-long existence and network effect characterized, characterized by its large and diverse use base contributes to its credibility and resilience. The longer Bitcoin persists and decentralized digital currency, the less likely it is to be dis dismissed. So 
it's, it's done more than a decade now and it's still alive and it isn't like worth pennies like it was in the beginning less than pennies in the beginning it's now worth tens of thousands and it's creeping towards a hundred thousand in some countries it's over a hundred thousand now just because their their money is debased already so if it can get through another 10 years then it's going to have got through at least two more a minimum of two more halving events so it should be it, it, it should stay through time. Now, there hasn't been a single currency in the world in history, right, that has survived 50 years. And the dollar and so on is creeping towards 50 years at the moment. And this is something that you should research. And if you start in the letter A for every single currency you go through, you will, you will find it very difficult and a very long time to get to about C or D without long time going by so let's continue on 12 reasons why people should buy bitcoin today regardless of it being a bubble all right so potential future for growth bitcoin's limited supply increasing demand suggests the potential for long-term price appreciation driven by adoption and scarcity and network effects this is the reason why um, my wife and i we decided to do it because it's a gamble over 20 years, right? It has a potential. And the potential is that it, it could be times one, times two, times three, times five in 20 years time. And I'm willing to take that gamble because I didn't take that gamble in 2009 where I would have had billions today or hundreds of millions or hundreds of thousands today if I had adopted it. And, and that's the worst thing you could do is always say, if I had done it. So me and my wife went, well, we can save this money again. And we have saved this money again since we invested it. So let's put it in. It's worth the gamble. Portfolio diversification. Since we have bought Bitcoin, it's taught us to diversify, right? And we have bought other stocks and shares and stuff. And we did take money out and we are now moving to start put it back into shares again because we took it out for other reasons. But we're starting to move it back into the shares once again. Inflation hedge, we've talked about this already. You know, your money, $1,000, bread, and so on. Your, your Bitcoin, it might be worth more or less in a year's time, but your money, if in euros, is going to be worth less. So, you know, Bitcoin has the possibility to be working less, be worth the same, less or more, whereas your, your euros, dollar, yen is going to be worth less. And that's facts. So, we don't, you know, Bitcoin wins there. Store of value. Now, the argument that Michael Saylor uses is that if I have a car, right? Well, sorry, he had loads of money that he had to take out of um, a country in, in, in America, Southern America. And the person, oh, he was not in America, and he said, all right, I've got, let's say, $100,000. How can I get this money out of the country right now without it losing any more value? And uh, so he said, go and buy boats, right? Go and buy the biggest boat that you can possibly buy right now with that money. So the guy went off and bought a small yacht, right? Because that yacht just needs to, a small boat yacht just needs to be sailed back over to Europe or anywhere in the world. And someone else will see it as a store of value. Someone else will buy it from you. They don't care how you paid for it. You could have paid for it in cucumbers, you could have paid for it in tomatoes. They don't care because they see a boat in front of them. And that is a store of value. Now, that boat just needs a hurricane or it needs something or a fire to destroy it. And then it's not a store of value anymore. It's just lots of carbon on the floor. Now, Bitcoin could survive a fire. Bitcoin could survive a storm. Bitcoin could, could survive a tsunami. As long as there are still people with the, uh, the blockchain, the network, up and running. So that's the only thing required is at least one or two computers in the world or mobile phones in the world or something on the moon, we don't know, or one of the satellites that still has that ledger available for the history of Bitcoin. That's the only thing it needs. It needs it needs Elon Musk to take a copy of, of the ledger that's up to date and put it on a satellite and that satellite stays in orbit all the time and that is the surviving the surviving member there so it's achievable but a tsunami 
could wipe out everything, all stores of value of anything that you have, gold and all precious metals naturally will stay the same. And everything will go back to carbon in the end, so you have to build everything. But that's what it's saying. Global accessibility. Yeah, Bitcoin, if, you, if, it's, if the network is stored in satellites going around the world, that's all it needs. You just need internet. So if Elon Musk says, okay, Starlink is going to be the Bitcoin network, it could be just as long as that that's the, the the network data is stored there and there's the likes of of being able to put data into water or dna soon right which they've done already but it's not been implemented yet at a wide scale so we don't even need to have like huge data centers in the future um so there's a possibility there Techno technological innovation that's what i was just saying here is how can you uh, easily create bitcoin bitcoins through the hashes and so they've, they've said that um it costs a lot of money to do it well there's there's places where there are um like oil mines gas mines etc etc where there's huge amounts of waste energy coming out you see smoke you see fire you see steam coming out with or without bitcoin right nothing to do with bitcoin so they've just added a, a let's call it a, a cap, a turbine, or whatever it is, onto this energy that's coming out to make this turbine spin. And this turbine that spins generates electricity, huge amounts of electricity. And that electricity can go into running all of the mining machines that's there. So the people that are mining that gas or doing whatever it is they were doing to have that wasted energy from their plants, the the Bitcoin miners are using that energy to mine Bitcoin. So it's basically free. The only thing they have to do is have a, a computer, a GPU, whatever, that is good enough to keep up with the hash rate of the Bitcoin network. So there are so many ways and means of getting around this bit here. And emerging institutional support. We see the talks now of more and more companies coming in. You know, at the moment, I think they they can all just be placed on one hand, right? As in the big ones putting in hundreds of millions or billions or whatever. But over the course of a couple of years that I've been in Bitcoin, it has started. So what is it going to be like over the next one, two, three, four, five years? And what the price is the price going to be like then? So only time can tell with this, but you have to have the patience. Financial sovereignty. Owning Bitcoin grants individuals greater control over their financial assets, free from the constraints of traditional banking systems and government intervention. So if you are in the UK, from my understanding, that if you have gold and you suddenly find lots and lots of gold, you don't own that gold, the government owns that gold, or the monarch owns that gold. So you don't own it anyway because it was found on the land. Now with Bitcoin, you could do whatever to get your Bitcoin, have your mobile phone, and as long as you know the private key for that, you could throw away your mobile phone, swim around the world, right, with literally nothing, go and ask someone to sit at a computer to make payment and type in your, your, the private key, the password for it, and you would be able to complete that transaction and then literally swim back again. So you don't need any, you don't need any forms to be able to, to do this. And you know that, no bank, no one, as long as you're the only person that knows the password to that private key, you're the only person that can change this, all right? So decentralization, we've already spoke about this, is you could just put uh, all of the, 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 the ledgers on satellites or on the moon or any planets, as long as that signal has been transmitted backwards and forwards at a high speed, so everyone can uh, always be updated with new items that come on the ledger, this is super possible. So decentralization is the whole part of the Bitcoin network already, but this has already been achieved and this will only get better. Rapid technological uh, technological advancement. Well, with the likes of um, AI and GPUs, NVIDIA and so on, the computers are getting stronger, faster, more efficient all the time. So this has already been happening over the past 10 years because of AI. And the Bitcoin network or cryptocurrencies network, is when it's to do with, crypt, when it's to do with um, cryptography, they're already doing this because cryptocurrency is just basically cryptography. So if AI needs huge amount of computation power, and if you've already got an AI here that needs huge computation power, it means that Bitcoin can use that, the old version of that as well. So any old version of AI can easily be used by the Bitcoin network. 
growing retail investment we've already talked about this more and more people are coming in but it needs a lot more people 8 billion or 8.5 billion people in the world it needs a lot of people to to get into it and at the moment when people do say we're early we are early for it because there's been next to no one actually come into it yet when you look at the percentage of people who own cryptocurrencies Long-term value proposition. Despite short-term price fluctuations, Bitcoin's fundamental value proposition as a borderless, censorship-resistant and immutable digital asset remains intact, underpinning its long-term viability as a store of value. So, you know, I've got a counter-argument to this, is that, you know, 12 months ago, two years ago, um, the Bitcoin was roughly the same price. You could have bought and sold the same thing and it would have kept its value. But if the price just keeps going up, then obviously it has now more value than it had previously. But it needs to have these consistent ups and downs for, be able to, for people to understand that it was overbought, then it got equilibrium price, oversold, and it keeps needs to just have this continuous amount of it can't just go up and down, up and down, up and down. It needs to have this consistency of increasing the value, but with this volatility. So as long as it doesn't go sideways for the rest of time, it needs to continuously move in increasing value. So finally, five reasons why Bitcoin is not a store of value. And I believe this is the most important bit. Volatility, we just spoke about this. As long as Bitcoin goes in a straight line, like has has growth, you know, at growth rate, it can go up and down and over it. But as long as someone can predict the price of Bitcoin is going to be between this range over the coming years. So if they buy something now, they know in the coming years with Bitcoin, it's going to be worth around, it's going to be the minimum this price and maximum that price. So it means that you, you've got some form of indication when to buy Bitcoin and when to sell Bitcoin. Limited adoption. Despite its growing acceptance, Bitcoin has not achieved widespread adoption. We've talked about this already as a medium of exchange or store of value compared to traditional stores of value like gold or fiat currencies. Its relatively low adoption rate limits its utility as universal. This is true, but the Internet took time. AI took time. Other things took time. You know, mobile phones took time till everyone had one. The, the, every, the, world, still, the world still doesn't have... Um, internet everywhere and let's go even more basic than internet every person on the planet here i mean every single person doesn't have clean water so let's just stay at clean water shall we right and so when every person on the planet has clean water then everyone should have um, some form of, of currency that we can trust as well. So this is this is kind of like the, 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 the target for everyone to have clean water first because we should have that. Um, regulatory uncertainty. Well, I don't think, you know, five years ago, Bitcoin had a big problem with China and all sorts of stuff, but we've now got the ETFs. This is now part of the, the, the American stock market. This ain't going nowhere. There's too much money involved and too much losses. And we've seen in 2008 that if one bank goes down, another one goes down, another one goes down and so on. And it brings a, a, a financial crisis. So they ain't going to do stuff like that. Risks. Well, inherent risk, including the cybersecurity. Well, there's boats on rivers. There's boats on rivers. They've got nothing to do with blockchain here that can get shut down. There are planes. There are trains. There are all sorts of stuff that don't have blockchain that can go down, right? So this is this is another reductionism, just to point finger at Bitcoin, because this can happen everywhere and anywhere, all right? Competition from alternatives. Well, Bitcoin has doesn't have a competition, okay? There's many, many people out there that think they can beat Bitcoin, but there's only one Bitcoin, and it and it, they've come and they've gone, right? And, and they, they just don't have it. So, um, you know, you can invest in some of the, the, the other coins and stuff like that. Solana is probably, Solana is not a competition to Bitcoin, but it's definitely in the race, okay? And it will never be able to catch up with Bitcoin, never. But it's in the race. Ethereum, Solana, now that's a competition, right? And I can see Solana 
catching up with uh, Ethereum and I can see Solana taking over Ethereum and going even further. But if Solana goes further, Bitcoin's already gone further. So um, that's basically it. With that said, whoa, I don't know how long this video was, but thank you very much for watching. If you are new to Bitcoin and you were like a little bit unsure about what, whether you should or shouldn't buy Bitcoin, should or shouldn't sell Bitcoin, this, that and the other, and what's going to happen in the future and many other questions, then at least now you've got um, some more information for you to decide whether or not Bitcoin is or isn't speculative. And you can ask yourself about other things. So just replace BTC with with the US dollar or the U the euro or with this or that and just replace that because a lot of these points here this is very generic you can kind of replace bitcoin here with many other things as well and and you can then start asking your questions about it all right with that said my name is David Thorne thank you very much for watching i hope this has been incredibly helpful for, to you it's been fun doing it as well and i've kind of enlightened myself whoops i've kind of enlightened myself a little bit about bitcoin too even though i was already kind of satisfied with why i've invested and none of this changes my mind because for me it's a long-term thing it is a gamble i'm just going to tell you it's a gamble there is high risk that that it does go to zero uh, you know you've got to take that risk but everything else can go to zero too so if one can go to zero, the other one can go to zero too. Okay, thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next video. Ciao, ciao, and goodbye.